So how do enterprises begin? All enterprises start with one or more people who have an idea that they maybe will make them money, uh, but certainly if you're a social entrepreneur will improve society or the community or the environment in which you live. Social enterprises, based on work that is available from sustainable enterprise solutions, suggests that social enterprises are far more likely to be started by groups of people, often six to eight people. In contrast, private enterprises are usually started when a single person goes self-employed or maybe two people go into partnership. Those founders, at least in the first instance, provide the labour that the enterprise needs to get going. Now founders usually have two relationships to their enterprise. They direct it and become its directors, and they work for it and become its labour force. And that might be all they're seeking to achieve. They might only be trying to create employment for themselves. But for many, they may choose or be forced by demand for services and goods to recruit more labour so that they can expand their operations. So founders start to recruit other people to help them produce goods and services. They're not just providing labour, they're also recruiting labour. And after the startup phase comes to an end, they'll continue to invest in improving skills in producing goods and services. They'll continue to recruit and develop labour. Now the recruitment of labour might take many forms. It might be that you're recruiting volunteers or contractors or other individuals and companies that act as suppliers. The labour might be the owner members, you know, the founders, or it might be people who are recruited to um, work under employment contracts. So there's a range of legal statuses, but whatever their status, they are all sources of labour for the enterprise and the fair shares model encourages you to treat them as labour members or labour shareholders. Now, as soon as you've got goods and services that meet people's needs, you're going to find that people want to use them, maybe buy them. So that's going to create more demand for labour. But we need to remember that sometimes people might labour for themselves. In other words, they produce goods and services and they consume them themselves. In a food co-op, you might grow food and then you'll use that food. If you put solar panels on your roof, uh, either individually or as a collective, you'll probably want to use the energy that you produce and just sell what you don't need to the market. Similarly, in sports clubs and theatre co-ops, you're going to be consciously uh, creating the um, sports environment and the theatre environment, but you might also buy tickets to go and see what you've produced. So there's a difference between production for use and production for market. In a production for use economy, the workers consume their own produce and they only sell surpluses in the marketplace. But under a system of production for market, people are prevented from consuming their own produce. When you go to work, if you were to take something from work, you might end up being reported to the police. And so under threat of prison, you don't use what you produce at work. So under a production for market system, labour is required to produce for others. And then when they've got their wages, they go back to the market and get goods for themselves. There may only be a few users, large users, or there may be many small scale users, but whichever. For an enterprise to become stable, it's got to have a sufficient number of users to ensure that there's enough work for the people who do the production. And that applies whether it's an enterprise that's doing production for use or production for the market. And lastly, we have investors. Now, an enterprise can expand more rapidly with the help of what we might call non-users who invest additional time, skills and money. Non-users may not be needed. However, more complex projects, particularly if you're going to engineer things, build things, uh, do buildings, construction, 
They're going to benefit if you can find non-users who can provide you with financial capital. But even if you do that, they're not the only investors. Founders, people who provide labour and the users of products and services are continually investing their time, effort and skills. They invest human, intellectual, social capital and they might provide you with finance capital as well. So we need to say, if this is how the world is, why do we design organisations to not recognise all of the interests necessary survival that we're showing in this diagram here? Why do we not automatically invite people in all of these groups to become legal members of the enterprise? The crux of fair shares is that we believe that if an enterprise does not recognise all the stakeholders necessary for survival, it creates additional complexity because relationships are much more likely to require legal remedies and expensive systems for legal compliance. <laughs>